Why has Peep Show become such a cult classic? If you clicked on this video, you probably remember the zeitgeist of the last decade. Peep Show brunches, Peep Show quizzes, Dobby Club. I even made someone a Peep Show themed birthday card. There was clearly something about this quintessentially British programme that appealed to millennials, Gen Z be damned. And as far as I can tell, it still does. So come with me now as we explore the social, political and nigh on existential impact of Peep Show on the way we think. Tonight should be a free fire idea zone. Watch a video essay. Eat some pizza. Fuck each other. All the way to crush you some vegetables! <laughs> For those not in the know, Peep Show was a British sitcom that ran for nine series between 2003 and 2015, encapsulating life in the early 21st century through the foibles of two men, Mark and Jeremy, neither of whom appear to have their lives entirely together. I've started to get this feeling that I'm totally, totally fucked. We see events play out from both Mark and Jeremy's points of view, and these points of view are literal. The camera work is almost always done through the characters' eyes, with their thoughts layered on top. You've brought a snake. Yeah. Oh god, he's brought a venomous plus one. Internal monologue icing on the audiovisual cake. In fact, the show is almost as awkward as that metaphor I just made, but it's much better written, and it's no mistake that Peep Show currently holds the record for the longest running sitcom on Channel 4. Four? That's insane. But it's also got a very particular attitude, an attitude that's hard to pin down. One of the top comments on this particular clip show gives us an indication. This show is like an intrusive thought in physical form. Another posits, this show was the pinnacle of centuries of British cultural development. Which is it? What's Peep Show really about? Well, to figure that out, we'll need some help from another Mark. Mark Fisher was a political theorist, responsible for coining the term capitalist realism, off the back of the following quote, attributed loosely to both Friedrich Jameson and Slavoj Žižek, that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Fisher used this idea to build a philosophical framework for viewing capitalism and its effects on society at large. Like the Big Beats Manifesto, but a bit more political. Have you read the Big Beat Manifesto lately? In fact, Fisher wrote a book on the subject that's only grown more relevant since its first publication in 2009. There's a theme that sits across Fisher's writings, a twisted nostalgia for a future that may never come. His search for hope, a reason to prove his own concept of capitalist realism wrong, this is wrong. led him down a dark path. Mark ended his life in 2017, but his ideas continue to provide solace and reflection to this day. Now. How on earth am I going to stick together capitalist realism and peep show without angering roughly 99% of Britain's edgy leftists? Well, let's start with Mark. The peep show Mark. Oh god, this is confusing. Mark Corrigan is a man who likes to keep things in order. Or, as Jeremy puts it, Like fisted cock muncher. <sighs> Mark's view of the world is structured by his innate belief that the system works. Relax, Mark, heads don't explode. That the various instruments of human civilization exist for a reason, and that our success in the future can be shaped by our understanding of the past. At least, I assume that's why he keeps referencing the Battle of Stalingrad. Those kids have no idea whatsoever of what went on at Stalingrad. In this respect, Mark expresses a faith in the status quo through his belief that the world is logical. Human beings are rational actors, and there therefore exists a set of inviolable home truths that one should expect to obtain in any given situation. Nothing you want is ever going to happen. That's the real world. Maybe somewhere you can earn a living sitting around drinking margaritas through a curly plastic straw, but in this world you've got to turn up, log on and grind out. This is, broadly speaking, rational choice theory, but it can also sound a lot like cynicism. Mark has an adage in his back pocket for whenever anything goes right or wrong for him or anyone else. But regardless, he believes in a certain logic, if not fairness, that underlines the status quo. Charles will be a fine thing. In his work as a loan manager for JLB Credit, Mark sees stability, but also the potential for growth, both personally and professionally. He owns his own home. He plays the game. Mark's rationalisation aligns with Fisher's notion that capitalism is capable of metabolising and absorbing anything with which it comes into contact. In this context, Mark's adages are a motley painting 
of everything that ever was. Not just work, but culture, from food to TV to crack addicts. Crack. Or ideas that can be subsumed under Marx's philosophy. And also Marx's philosophy. Anything that doesn't fit into this view of the world gets thrown away. Fisher argued that capitalism prioritises itself by showing up alternatives as a dangerous illusion. He suggests that capitalist realism presents itself as a shield, protecting us from the perils posed by belief itself. Belief in anything different. This shows up in one of Marx's more polemic speeches. There are systems for a reason in this world. Economic stability, interest rates, growth. It's not all a conspiracy to keep you in little boxes, all right? It's only the miracle of consumer capitalism that means you're not lying in your own shit, dying at 43 with rotten teeth, and a little pill with a chicken on it is not going to change that. Now, come on. Fuck off. Sounds like Mark subscribes to the Thomas Hobbes line of thought that everyone is a dick shit but me. That without structure, as Hobbes put it, life would be nasty, brutish, and short. But Mark assumes that it's capitalism, and only capitalism, that can give us this structure. There's also something to be said for how Mark treats the people around him, the secondary characters in Peep Show. Compared to Jeremy, Mark is arguably more of a schemer, sociopathic even. The lengths he goes to in pursuing April in University Challenge is just one example. Who's your tutor? Professor Netball, Kaiser Soze, McLeish. Then there's Mark's attitude to his work colleagues, and his dating quarries. While the way things start off with him and Sophie are relatively innocent, you can say the same for Dobby. Mark plays Simon, Gerard and Dobby all off against one another to get into her good books. Mark, you're not trying to get away with pretending you're a normal human being, are you? What can you say? You must have just been really keen on that particular personal cheese. In any case, Mark continues his love rivalry with Gerard even when the man is terminally ill. Then, when his will works out to Mark's detriment, he utters that Gerard must be shitting on me from heaven, like a dead, jealous pigeon. I guess the upshot here is that Mark is an adept user. He doesn't necessarily see people as people, but as means to an end. A means of advancing himself under capitalist realism. Maybe this goes back to his drive to have what he perceives as an ideal life. To the extent that he marries someone he doesn't want to marry, and has a child with someone, he doesn't really want a family with. See also his desperation to go on repeated holidays to the Quantocks, even though they are, by all accounts, quite crap. East Anglia for life. So Mark thinks that he can get exactly what capitalism is lined up to give him. But that means that he doesn't always show the people around him the respect they deserve. And that includes his flatmate. I mentioned how Mark owns his own home. Well, Jeremy lives in that home. Work shy freeloader. He's a despondent slacker who often fails to make rent. At the beginning of the series, he's a struggling musician. Yeah, I'm a musician. And his music is often played as being comically bad. <laughs> in terms of worldview, it's almost easier to see Jeremy as the cynical one. He realised that tin food is just for crackheads and wars. Even though that's the label he often pins on Mark. Jeremy rejects the mainstream. Mark's life of books and computer games, and prefers to go on a mad one, and then forget the consequences. At the end of the day, Jeremy is basically apathetic to the system that Mark believes in so much. Most people don't do their shopping right now, yeah? Most people are out right now, yeah? He shows this in myriad ways, from when he tries to avoid getting a job at Mark's company. Got to do something. Are you okay? To when he tries to get a defendant off the hook while he's doing jury service after sleeping with her, after finding out she's guilty. Jeremy is the yin to Mark's yang. He's a free spirit, but at the end of the day, Jeremy rarely does much to actually improve his lot. He pootles about in life, letting the nonsense come to him, and welcomes it with open arms. But when it comes to his worldview and his politics, he's nothing much. What would Fisher say about this? Well, Jeremy's worldview aligns with Fisher's concept of the early 21st century authentic anti-capitalist movement in the veins of Occupy, or the Spanish Indignados. They don't want capitalism, but they can't exactly tell you what they want instead. Fisher put it like this, the so-called anti-capitalist movement seemed to have conceded too much to capitalist realism. 
Since it was unable to posit a coherent alternative political economic model to capitalism, the suspicion was that the actual aim was not to replace capitalism, but to mitigate its worst excesses. And since the form of its activities tended to be the staging of protests rather than political organisation, there was a sense that the anti-capitalism movement consisted of making a series of political demands which it didn't expect to be met. Jeremy appears on the surface to want system change. Fuck you, Bush. But he frequently admits that what he really wants is money, women, and narcotics. How can he square that belief? Well, in the absence of those authentic anti-capitalist movements, there's always corporate anti-capitalism. Fisher says that our problems with capitalism can be sold back to us as products, usually consumable media that seem critical of the system on a surface level. Obviously, an MP3 or MP4 can't in itself bring the revolution. Fisher uses Live Aid and Wally as examples of products with these corporate anti-capitalist undertones, stating that these products seem to offer the fantasy that Western consumerism, far from being intrinsically implicated in systemic global inequalities, could itself solve them. All we have to do is buy the right products. So Fisher argues that capitalist realism can internalise opposition. And if Jeremy's awful music ever got a record deal, it would be a part of that system. In the meantime, Jeremy can keep playing the game guilt-free with the misled belief that he's somehow challenging the status quo. Jeremy's behaviours are also in line with what Fisher calls a hedonic depression in the British youth, an inability to do anything except pursue pleasure. Fisher notes that in his time as a college teacher, his students had become increasingly despondent and reluctant to challenge oppression. He connected this to the relative passivity at the time of British students compared to their French counterparts, claiming that the former faced a reflexive impotence because of their relative lack of life opportunities. Maybe Jeremy is in the same boat, full of hedonism, depression, and indeed boredom, brought on by the drudging search of an alternative, with the appearance of a trail gone cold. So it's not looking too rosy in the world of Peep Show. We've got Mark cozying up to capitalist realism, Jeremy, the despondent man child who can't see the wood for the trees. It's a dichotomy, as Fisher put it. Without delirium and confidence, capital could not function. Or as Mark would have it, yeah, the, the world turns on its axis, one man works while, while another relaxes. It's like Mark and Jeremy are two halves of the same mind, master and slave, ever in contradiction, just trying to live life right without pissing in a church. Who on earth can save us in these dire straits? This is bullshit! Sorry lads, locked doors, little switch just flicks. Superhands is a real wild card. While Mark is broadly complicit in capitalist realism, and Jeremy is stuck in hedonic depression, Superhands seems actively critical of the system. As Fisher put it, Hands is in a position to destroy the appearance of a natural order, to reveal what is presented as necessary and inevitable to be mere contingency. Fisher is talking there about protest politics and honest to goodness anti-capitalism. So when Hans, say, steals a delicious chocolate bar, there you go, free munchies. Did you snick this? Or asserts that he doesn't want a corporate logo in his foam. Find a Guinness, please. No logo on the foam. No logo on the foam. Or pours big brand cornflakes all over the floor. Nice uh, packet of crunchy nut you got here. Pretty expensive, as I recall. It all seems a pretty good indication that Super Hans is, in his own way, a peep show protest movement against capitalist realism. No wonder he causes Mark so much grief. Hands do not bloody. What did you say? The one problem with this idea is, despite the big talk, petty thievery, and crunchy nut crime, Hans is actually pretty underwhelming when it comes to direct action. This means he fails Fisher's other criterion for emancipatory politics to make what was previously deemed to be impossible seem attainable. In fact, Hans is pretty happy to cozy up to the establishment when it's politically expedient for him to do so. Sure, he'll take hard drugs and claim he just wants to fucking suck. I just wanna fucking suck, fucking suck, fucking suck, everyone. But calm him down and put him in a music studio, and he's a thwart of power, just like Mark. Obviously one of us has to be on reception at any one time, unless Hazel can cover, that's really important. Okay. He'll do what needs to be done to get on. The man's a crude opportunist. He's almost as bad as Keir Starmer. Each promise broken. Okay, enough politics, bands. Back to the matter at hands. 
So given that Hans is so subordinate, it's no wonder that at the end of the final series, he leaves for Macedonia. I'm gonna van it to Macedonia, finally set up the moped rental. Super Hans takes Jeremy's abstention and goes one further, leaving Normal Island altogether. An Asterius from Herbert Marcuse to Jenny O'Dell to Do No Wrong Man Owen Jones have maintained for decades. It's not easy to change the system when you don't have a voice within it. So we move now from discussing the lovable rogue to the arguable arch-capitalist of Peepshow's Creed. So how's Project Zeus coming along? Alan Johnson, or Johnson for short. Fundamentally, Johnson stands for what Fisher called business ontology, an attempt to run everything in society like a business, as if it were the obvious choice. One example of this is Johnson's incredibly transactional state of mind. This isn't just clear in how he effectively manipulates Mark, first as a boss and later as a business partner. No, the real juicy dirt, how can dirt be juicy, comes up in series four, when Johnson asks for Jeremy's permission to sleep with his friend Big Suze in exchange for 530 pounds. 530 pounds? Johnson thinks this is perfectly reasonable. You have a property of which I wish to make a use. Is that so very different from hiring a solicitor or leasing out a Spanish villa? Well, it is a bit different because you'd be putting your dick right. Furthermore, when Johnson proposes a free fire ideas zone or takes the team out for after work dinner, he's doing it by pulling work into leisure. As Fisher puts it, work and life become inseparable. Capital follows you when you dream. Perhaps the most egregious example is when his work on Johnson's Project Zeus leads to Mark receiving a lap dance while he's still on his laptop. <laughs> uh, we have no free time. Beyond the business ontology stuff, Johnson also shows how late stage capitalism can overtake the world as we actually perceive it. In series six, Mark gets into metaphorical and literal bed with Johnson to form Consultio Consultius. A company that really shows up what I'd probably call the facade of hyperreality. I'm bastardizing Baudrillard here, but bear with. The idea is that something becomes such a case of representation that it begins to bypass the real world and take precedence over it. With Consultio Consultius, Consultiarium, Mark is throwing thousands of pounds at a business venture with Alan, and he ends up having to take a part time job at a Mexican restaurant to make ends meet. Slowly, Mark starts to doubt that Consultio exists as a real business. Then, when an apparently real meeting takes place in his very own restaurant, Mark is punished by Johnson for prioritizing his material concerns and burritos over the hyper real consultancy firm that has now taken form, beyond mild assertions about mass redundancies and Windows Vista. Good old Vista. People give it a bad press, but I'm never upgrading. Why would I? It just feels like a good pair of jeans. You fancy making us some builder's tea? Wow. If Johnson really likes Vista, that's proof that he's pure evil. But if Consultio Consultius isn't proof enough that Johnson is a misleading sort, just look at his problems with substance abuse, his total disrespect for work colleagues, or his sheer potential to schmooze. Johnson falls apart at the end of series seven. More fool you, asshole. But by the end of series nine, he's at the top of the management chain again. These sorts of agents of capital can make a go of anything because their minds are set up to play the game. I mean, make no mistake, Johnson is incredibly charismatic, endearing, and responsible for some of the best peep show memes of all time. I've got a 32 inch plasma in mine. You get a document up on that baby and you are seriously looking at that document. In fact, it's heavily implied throughout the show that Mark fancies Johnson. He's all game for Johnson's corpo talk. Just us, a uh, pile of Chinese food and a couple of uh, fuck off spreadsheets. Oh yes, take me Johnson, I'm yours. But let's think about what we've discussed already. Mark is innately drawn to Johnson because Mark has confidence in the capitalist lifestyle for which Johnson is the exaggerated poster boy. He has the flash car, leather gloves, gold credit card. At the outset, Mark buys into everything Johnson says even though it's often not in his best interest. It appears that Johnson is at once a master manipulator and a doyen of self-destruction. In this respect, the inherent instability of Johnson 
is not too far from the capitalist mode of boom and bust. His alcohol problems are also representative of Fisher's delirium that runs rife through late capitalist life. What's more, he's apparently into pyramid schemes, and capitalism, well, capitalism's the biggest pyramid scheme there is. I'd like to close with a final, more sobering thought about Johnson. When JLB credit goes down the pan in series six. But I need to inform you that you're all officially unemployed. What? Just as the country was going down the pan likewise, Johnson seems rudderless. He starts getting jittery over milk. But we already have milk. Labeling oranges. And if she accidentally eats a Johnson orange, then he totally loses it. If we can confide in one thing, it's that agents like Johnson are only as strong as the institutions that surround them. Let's take a look at how the old dude brothers move through those institutions then. Jeremy faces an uphill struggle. He spends roughly series one through five being thrown this way and that in pursuit of music stardom, failing on every count. In series six, he starts at JLB right before it collapses in ways that remain confusing and nebulous to all of its workers. Oh well, more work for the men with Ven. In series eight, Mark buys him therapy sessions, only for him to spend the money on Indian takeaway. At which point Jeremy admits to having a problem. I'm a shithead, I need help, I need therapy. Only to become a life coach via his therapist and then a homeless life coach. Jeremy is an object of despair by the end of series eight and spends most of series nine questioning his sexuality to no avail. Jeremy's mental health throughout Peep Show is on average completely in the bin and he's adamant that he needs therapy. I need therapy. And that he should therapize others too. Fisher believed that the consumer good provided by therapy was a symptom of capitalism trying to internalize its contradictions. <coughs> To convince individuals that their poor mental health was always related to some individual circumstance, as opposed to systemic issues like poverty, wage slavery, or alienation. A great example of this therapy fail in practice is Big Mad Andy. When Jeremy starts life coaching him, he holds up therapy as some kind of incredible cure-all, until eventually spiralling to a point where he is literally fighting his own patient. That's not therapy! It's what he wants! Kick my nut bag! Do it! Do it! Fucking hell! Yes! Unsurprisingly, this doesn't work. What's more surprising is that Jeremy actually seems to enjoy his brief stint at JLB, as he turns out to be actually quite good at it, for reasons that even he doesn't understand. I've made like four sales. I'm zinging. Colin's put me top of the leaderboard. I'm in line for Pizza Hut vouchers. Comparing his slacker attitude to Mark's stringent work ethic, this doesn't particularly make any sense, but it provides evidence of another contradiction under capitalism. As Fisher puts it, that work represents two distinct realities, the one in which the services are provided without hitch, and another reality, the crazed Kafkaesque labyrinth of call centres, where cause and effect connect together in mysterious, unfathomable ways. Maybe Jeremy can do his job just as well as Mark can, because both jobs are looped up in a system that remains opaque and ill-explained. The sort of work that credit specialists do, arguably a thinly veiled attempt to keep the burgeoning financial sector of this increasingly greyed out hellscape afloat, is exactly the kind of work that David Graeber might call a bullshit job. They're literally doing nothing. In a sunnier, <coughs> more left wing world, with capital assets shared in common and workers' cooperatives, we wouldn't need JLB credit, just like we wouldn't need Credit Suisse. Loan managers, more like a loan managers. <laughs> But Mark doesn't ask himself what good he does as a loan manager. As discussed, he's an expert in rationalising his place within the institution he reveres. Meanwhile, Jeremy, economically downtrodden and minded to protest, is in a position to question his role. But as Fisher notes, individuals under capitalist realism aren't just defined by their class, they're defined by their particular ties to embedded, mass media reinforced systems of production. Jeremy has a class identity, but he also has loan repayments to make, so he believes that he needs loan managers. There goes the first beat of the butterfly wing that starts the next financial meltdown. So here we are then. Peep Show paints a world where two clashing personalities never reach a synthesis. There is no alternative for Mark and Jeremy. They keep stumbling through life, obeying the sitcom tradition of never quite getting what they want. Characters like Johnson and Hans just serve to further illustrate that in this world, capitulation is the only way to move forward. 
perhaps the best us edgy British leftists can hope for is that our world is one where change is a little more possible. Where there is an alternative to capitalist realism. Where things aren't so set in stone and aren't so futile. So Oh, oh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, like and subscribe for more. I'm as prolific as the Orgazoid when it comes to video essays. <laughs> oh, that was obscure. That was that was niche. Uh, okay, bye.